To, uh, welcome everyone to, the, to our fourth panel today. And um, our panel is uh, Arbitration, Energy and Climate Change. So my name is João Lombard and uh, I'm part of the organization of Talks with Arbitration Day. I'm just here to on behalf of the organization uh, yet again thank our sponsors for, for having allowed us to, to organize this event. Uh, Camp CCBC, Verano Advogados, Sesco Mariola, Foss, Tosino Freire, Prigoliano Advogados, Baraldi Marelli, Advogados de Marest, PLMJ, Advogados e Soto Correia Advogados. And, uh, and I would like to invite everyone that's uh, listening to us on YouTube to share your questions and your comments on the chat. Well, um, without much further ado, I will leave you now on, on the hands of Tibesa and Mergandi and the remaining speakers and hope that everyone has an enjoyable um, experience listening to the brilliant speakers we have today. Thank you so much. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to be with you today, and I would like to warmly thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate this panel. As you know, uh, our panel will address an extremely important and hot, in many respects, topic, which is arbitration, energy and climate change. And our panel is particularly topical because it's taking place on the last day of COP26. As you know, COP26 is the conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as well as to the Paris Agreement, and is the conference that brings together states to discuss how best to address climate change and how to make the transition towards a carbon-free and sustainable economy happening. Um, the question that our panelists have been asked to answer is how can arbitration promote or rather hinder the fight against climate change? And in particular, what types of disputes arise in connection with climate change and what types of issues uh, the energy transition may give rise to when there is a contractual relationship already in place, either with another private party or with a state, and how this contractual relationship may be affected by measures taken to address climate change. To address these questions, we have a fantastic panel composed of four experts and I will now um, introduce them very briefly. Um, we will kick off with Rafael Gallardi, who is partner at Demarest in Sao Paulo and whose expertise focuses on civil litigation and arbitration, public and regulatory law, energy, alternative investments and restructuring of companies. Rafael will give us an overview of the legal landscape in Brazil and tell us what kind of uh, disputes arise in connection with climate change in Brazil. We will then hear from Enrique Gonzalez Calvillo, who is founding partner at Gonzalez Calvillo based in Mexico City. Uh, whose expertise focuses on cross-border transactional matters with an emphasis in energy and M&A. Um, Enrique will touch upon the legal landscape in Mexico and tell us about renewables and disputes arising in connection with climate change in Mexico. 
We will then hear from Philippe Pansol, uh, who is a very experienced arbitrator, as well as the head of the international arbitration practice for continental Europe at Queen Emmanuel, and who is based in Geneva. Um, Philippe will uh, deal with a more technical aspect, which is long-term uh, contracts and the renegotiation of clauses of these contracts when there is a change of circumstances, such as measures taken to address climate change. And last but not least, we will hear from Susan Maples, who is counsel at Curtis Mallet in New York, who specializes in international arbitrations and corporate transactions, but who also has a background in the oil and gas sector. And Susan, Susan would talk to us about damages and how we factor in um, the energy transition in the calculation of damages, especially looking at contracts that were signed um, at a time where the energy transition um, was not really um, happening. Um, so I very much look forward to the audience question, but as you know, we will keep the questions um, to the end, and uh, we will use the chat to, um, you know, to I will read the questions in the chat, and then we will keep an interactive discussion. But without further ado, I will give the floor to Rafael. Thank you, TBSI. Uh, I would like to also thank the Oxford International Arbitration Society and the organizers, Ana Carolina Dallagnol, Andrea Luis Monteiro, João William Moreira, and Felipe Esperandio for the invitation to speak here uh, and congratulate for this wonderful uh, seminar. It's been it's been great to see so many uh, so many accomplished uh, practitioners joining together uh, to to speak about international arbitration. Um, and uh, we now turn to our attention to climate change uh, and uh, energy transition. Uh, and climate change related disputes, we know that they are a trend that will continue to grow, right? We've seen uh, a spike in the, in the recent years. And one of the few things that we can be sure about in this field is that that won't change. Uh, whether they take place in courtrooms or before arbitral tribunals, that's a different thing, but they will keep coming. Uh, and there may be several reasons for that, but I would emphasize two of them. One is that Climate litigation is merely one of the pillars of a broader effort to, to fight climate change and mitigate its consequences of the planet. So it's part of, um, let's say, corporate uh, uh, of, of climate governance. And second is that climate change will continue to disrupt life as we know in the planet. And disruption is a catalyst of dispute, right? Uh, disputes arise and flourish when there is disruption. Uh, if we turn to some numbers, uh, in the last uh, uh, in the last report by the UN identifies carbon emissions uh, as re responsible for 77 percent of um, the carbon emissions resulting from from the use of fossil fuels as 77 percent, and the remain uh, the remaining 23 percent result from the use of land. What is more concerning is that while roughly 25% of the unfrozen uh, land is already degraded, uh, the remaining portion of that uh, of that undegraded land is under dispute for the competing uses uh, that are all essential for uh, for for humankind. On one hand, there's the ever pressing need for food production and energy generation. On the other. Fighting climate change requires vast areas for production of biofuels and reforestation. And that's just part of the discussion because there's also the dispute for the use of water. For instance, in countries like Brazil, there's competing use of water for energy generation and, uh, and food production. So this is a landscape in which we can say for sure climate change related disputes will only grow. Given that scenario, what we thought about for this first presentation uh, of this panel is to provide an overview of what are the types of disputes that we may expect to stumble across when talking about climate change, right? And first talking about 
those disputes in general, and then diving uh, into the Brazilian landscape. Right? Uh, but what are climate change uh, related disputes? Those are disputes arising out of or in connection to the effect of climate change and climate change policy, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change or the, uh, and the Paris Agreement. That's a very uh, broad definition that we can see that in the, um, uh, in the, in the ICC report uh, of the Task Force uh, on Climate Change. But for the purposes of this presentation and to make, to make comprehension easier, I think that definition warrants, uh, warrants a distinction. In a narrow sense, climate change related uh, disputes are those disputes in which climate change regulation or the lack thereof constitutes the main cause of action and lies at the core of the requests uh, or, the, or the prayer for relief. Right? In essence, those are claims brought to either mandate or change climate-related uh, climate policies or conducts by states. Right? One may think of a claim against the state for failing to implement locally policies that are consistent with international commitments undertaken by that same state. Right? The natural mechanism to resolve such disputes uh, would be international investment arbitration when applicable, leaving the strong presence of public law and national states. Alternatively, uh, such disputes may also be referred to national courts. But we can also talk about climate change related disputes in a broader sense that would encompass all those cases that touch upon the discussion about climate change, but do not deal with the enforcement of international or national laws uh, precisely. In this broader sense, we are talking about a much wider range of cases, many of which may be referred to arbitration, either investment arbitration or international commercial arbitration. One can imagine the case of an investor claim against the state if the investment is affected by a natural disaster or if the economics of the investment are drastically changed due to climate change events. Such a case may be referred to international investment arbitration or to commercial arbitration if provided in uh, local arbitration law. That's the case, that's precisely the case of Brazil that is not part of exit, but it accepts arbitration for resolving disputes uh, from uh, investors against, uh, against the state. Right. Uh, Going further uh, a little bit on the ICC Commission report on resolving climate change related disputes through arbitration, we can see that there are three types of, uh, of uh, climate change related disputes. One, the first is disputes arising specifically from transition adapt adaptation or mitigation contracts entered into uh, to meet uh, climate change goals or commitments. An example would be a dispute between an owner and a contractor in relation to the construction of a solar panel uh, solar panel field. Let's say that the output of that uh, of that uh, of that plant is insufficient to warrant approval uh, by the government, and therefore a dispute ensues as to uh, who's uh, as to the responsibility and losses uh, caused by that by by such uh, by such result such uh, performance result of the plant. Um, arguably, any claim that arises out of contracts related to energy transition or industries that are essential uh, to enable compliance with global climate uh, goals may qualify in this broader sense as climate uh, change related disputes, since, pro since such products, they lie at the core of the main driver for climate change, which is energy transition. So when we are, whenever we're talking about disruption, delays, or performance quality in uh, construction, for instance, of large scale uh, renewables, energy renewables projects, we are ultimately talking about uh, 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 climate change because those are tools, uh, uh, the most efficient tools to fight climate change that we have at this point. Uh, the second, the uh, category identified by the ICC report are disputes arising from contracts where performance has been impacted by parties' responses to changes in national laws and regulations, or uh, the environmental impacts of climate change itself. 
Uh, an example of this uh, category would be a dispute between a car manufacturer who requires refrigerant gas of a particular specification to meet emissions uh, regulations. The manufacturer uh, was supplied with gas that did not meet those specifications, leading the authorities to force the manufacturer to suspend delivery of, uh, of vehicles. The, manufact the, car, the, the car manufacturer then turns to the supplier seeking damages because of this uh, because of this consequence but now we can imagine uh, a, a different scenario in which the same uh, the same uh, the same gas is internationally banned due to its effects on global warming but there's nothing in local law incorporating international this is international standard being an, a multinational entity the supplier ceases production to meet its own policies or even policies of its headquarters. Right? The common manufacturers uh, then starts legal action for breach of contract and seeking damages. That is ultimately also a climate change related dispute because climate change uh, policy and climate and fighting climate change is at the core of the facts underlying the dispute. Right? And uh, the, the third and last category uh, identified by the the ICC report is the uh, are disputes which the parties agree to arbitrate after the dispute uh, has arisen. Uh, for for example, the, the example given is an indigenous uh, population and an infrastructure corporation uh, where the latter's activities has, have had an environmental impact, and the parties after the problem arises agree to solve the problem through arbitration. Right. The, nat the natural venue for, the, for this dispute would be naturally um, uh, national courts because there is no, there's no arbitration agreement prior, uh, uh, pre-existing uh, arbitration agreement. But uh, nothing prevents parties from entering into a submission agreement and uh, arbitrating that dispute. But if we go into more specific, we can find different types of claims. Uh, than those uh, or subcategories of those claims. Uh, first, are corporate governance claims against companies and officers for, for instance, misrepresentation of exposure of the venture to climate change. Second, uh, misrepresentation of potential impacts of climate change over the ventures. And third is breach of fiduciary duties when dealing with climate change issues policies or impacts. All those issues, they may be referred to arbitration. That's the case, for instance, in Brazil, in which, corp in, in, in which uh, corporations law allow uh, bylaws to mandate arbitration uh, in disputes uh, between uh, minor shareholders and uh, uh, shareholders and the company or between shareholders. So this, this is one, a natural field in which this uh, in which this may lead to climate related uh, climate change related disputes in arbitration right and we have similar cases that already exist they are not uh, they, are, they are they talk about uh, what could be uh, qualified as natural disasters uh, which in you see the arbitrations with Valley uh, and San Marco which in, with the mining companies when, when dams collapsed and shareholders are, uh, are suing the company, they are doing that through arbitration. So that is a reality in Brazil already. We can envisage also claims arising out of financing agreements to fund projects aimed, aimed at fighting climate change. That's a possibility. Uh, and we can, we can talk about insurance claims following natural disasters resulting from uh, climate change. And the last that I'm going to only mention because it's going to be dealt with uh, brilliantly, I'm sure, by Philippe, which is a hardship and renegotiation of long term concession agreements that suffer the effects of natural disasters or, or, or uh, other climate change related events. So all of those are uh, claims that are that are uh, suitable for uh, for international arbitration, either investment arbitration or commercial arbitration, or let's say non-investment arbitration, 
and that go beyond what you would expect the typical climate change related dispute, which would be the narrow sense that we've, uh, that we've talked about. And that is important to, to highlight those issues because those are opportunities for lawyers and for practitioners to, to get into the fight for, uh, of climate change and in which the, uh, the, dis the disputes for uh, mandating public policies may, may sound something like very distant, very limited to a very uh, a select group of professionals or even to public law uh, attorneys. And that is not precisely the case. There is plenty of opportunity to be involved in these discussions, but in either side of these discussions, for, for that matter. Right. And how's the landscape in Brazil? Right. Climate change lit lit litigation is picking up uh, in Brazil. It has already reached Brazilian courts. Uh, we have had several decisions in the past since uh, since the early 90s using climate change as an argument to grant reliefs to for environmental protection or in uh, compensations to environmental damages but only recently we've had cases based on uh climate change policies specifically for climate change policies one interesting lawsuit was filed by federal prosecutors in, in the city of Arulhos, which is where the main uh, international airport of the country is located. It's it was filed against the air carriers, and it is aimed at forcing the air carriers to plant as much trees as are uh, necessary for them to neutralize the, the car their carbon emissions locally. Um, there's a, uh, a, second, uh, a second interesting lawsuit, which was filed just in October last year, to force the, go the, the federal government by an NGO to force the federal government to uh, to actually comply with its own plan to to protect and monitor the rainforest, right? Seeking inaction by the federal government, uh, uh, arguing inaction by the federal government, and we have an interesting case as well, which is a case for, for uh, a claim for damages by the federal government against a farmer who traded uh, large. Uh, large quantities of timber allegedly using forged, cert forged certificates of origin. Right? And, there, and what, what the federal government did was calculate based on the, on the amount of timber that was sold, uh, they, they uh, used, they calculated how much coal that would, would, that would generate and, and, and how much those, how, how, and how many emissions that would, uh, that would generate. And based on calculations of the World Bank, they, they calculated the, the, uh, the environmental impact and the monetary uh, in, uh, expression of that, which is a very complex case. It's still, uh, it's still ongoing. None of those cases have been decided yet. But one very uh, interesting case was uh, filed also against an, uh, an NGO, uh, by an NGO against a thermal plant and the federal uh, environmental agency seeking to force the agency to include uh, climate change assessment as part of the licensing process of the plant. And, and federal courts granted the injunction to force, to annul the existing process to, to, to grant the license and to, to force, force the agency to include, um, to include climate change as part of the assessment to be made before granting the license. Of course, the next logical step is for it to hit arbitral tribunals, right? It has, we have something related to, as, as, to that, as, as I already mentioned, but we still don't have uh, some of the, of the cases, uh, any of the cases that I have uh, discussed um, before, uh, the typical climate change related disputes in arbitration. But my, my, my estimation is that that is a, a matter of time. And that's important because legal change is a driver, legal action is a driver for change, right? So we have to keep that in mind, legal action and market pressure, right? We have in the Brazilian experience, uh, market pressure being very effective to implement anti-corruption practice. So any every party that would retain services or uh, buy uh, or enter into a relevant contract would require its counterparty 
to abide by international standards in anti-corruption, in environmental practices, in working conditions, in safety, that improved in general the quality of, uh, uh, of uh, Brazilian standards uh, uh, during the years. So the same thing needs to happen with uh, climate change. And interestingly enough, once you do that, you make climate change a contractual obligation and therefore you open the door for uh, arbitration uh, as, as a dispute resolution mechanism. Let's hope that this uh, comes through in the very near future because we all need it. Thank you, uh, Tibisai. Those were uh, my messages for today. And of course, I look forward for the questions. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this overview. Um, which really sets the scene. And now we're going to hear from Enrique and see how this uh, landscape in Brazil either differs or compares to the landscape in Mexico. So Enrique, you have the floor. Thank you, Tibisai. And, and I also wish to express my appreciation to the University of Oxford and to the organizers of this great event, starting with Andre Luis Monteiro, um, really a pleasure to be joining you. And certainly my appreciation to my fellow uh, uh, colleagues in this, in this uh, panel. The, uh, in Mexico, it only gets worse because um, I would subscribe uh, the ideas expressed by Rafael, but I would take it to, an, a, a, to, to have a very concerning extreme in the case of Mexico because uh, as you have probably read uh, or uh, uh, been hearing about uh, the case of Mexico gets worse, gets even, even more concerning if we take into account all of the actions which the Mexican government is uh, carrying out today, very much uh, going against investors and in many cases with respect to, uh, uh, to uh, renewables, uh, which were arising at, at a very interesting, uh, at, at very interesting numbers, and which unfortunately are, are are suffering from these actions. So, so part of what Rafael said would apply to Mexico without any question. But, but in the case of Mexico, it, it would be really important for everyone listening that that uh, the situation of Mexico is is quite quite concerning when it comes to energy. And, and, uh, and uh, indirectly cl climate change, because these actions are clearly intended to, to take us to a different direction, as opposed to uh, being in harmony with the rest of the world and, uh, and the economies that believe in the very serious effects of climate change and the things that need to be done in countries like ours. The, so this discussion, as I was uh, uh, discussing it uh, a few days ago with TBSI, is, is very timely uh, with respect to Mexico, because all that we're going to say today with regard to my country uh, leads us to, well, I would say one very first conclusion. Uh, arbitration is going to be very busy in my country. Extremely busy, I would say. Uh, uh, things are about to explode because uh, the, the, the actions that I will describe very briefly for you are, are just in the, in the direction of taking us to abundant numbers of investment treaty arbitration uh, that uh, we will be discussing with you today and which have a very serious effect to, uh, to the environment. The... Uh, uh, the, the point here is uh, that, uh, yes, we're going to be very busy with arbitration in Mexico because uh, we would start by saying that Mexico is, is one of the countries with the most number of, invest, of investment treaties in the world because Mexico is, is probably the, the country with the most number of free trade agreements. Uh, I think that the only country that has more uh, treaties of, of that is uh, free trade agreements in the world is Israel, but we would be one of the top five without any question. 
So each of these, uh, each of these uh, free trade agreements has an investment treaty which provides for investment treaty arbitration in certain events. And uh, most definitely, those events are contemplated for purposes of initiating actions against uh, the, the decrees and bills which uh, the, the present administration is, is intending to pass in, in our country. And uh, those actions are uh, targeted almost directly without any question, are taking against private participation in oil and gas and power generation. Uh, very much going against trends like, like Brazil without going in further that where we, where we see that uh, President Bolsonaro is, is even trying to introduce or ent entertaining introducing the privatization of, of Petrobras. Uh, in Mexico, it's the other way around. These actions are intended to give back to Pemex and to the CFE, which is, uh, which is our state utility, all the power that they allegedly lost with the, uh, with the energy reform that uh, Mexico uh, passed uh, uh, in, in 2013 and which allowed and provided for massive investments uh, by private uh, operators in both uh, oil and gas as well as power projects. So, uh, in, in this specific regard, then those of the power projects that are being affected would, would be primarily renewables. Not only renewables, but the very first ones that come to mind are going to be renewables. And uh, the, we are talking about a number of projects that will be affected. If this bill passes through our Congress, or if at the end of the day, uh, the constitutional actions before our, uh, before our courts, including the Supreme Court, confirm or do not confirm that these acts and these laws are actually unconstitutional. So at this, at this time, we have not seen, only with one exception, we have not seen all of these uh, investment treaty arbitration cases starting, but it is only a matter of time. It's one of the things that we have that we have been uh, analyzing with with Andre, with Andre Luis, because uh, it is definitely a scenario that uh, our legal profession and uh, the colleagues in the world that are dedicated to arbitration need to have in mind, because this is unfortunately going to become. Uh, a, a very massive number of of cases. The um, it, it uh, most in most of the analysis with our clients, with our energy clients, uh, the, the the a certain a certain set of cases reminds of what is going on in Mexico, what we had in, in Spain in two thousand eight. Uh, for for uh, all of you who are familiar with with investment treaty, that uh, that year the uh, the Spanish government uh, uh, undertook a series of changes, very important regulatory changes uh, affecting renewables in Spain, and that led to a number of of cases against the Kingdom of Spain, and. Uh, that very same path is something that we would uh, we, that we would be contemplating to occur in Mexico. It's the same set of circumstances. It's regulatory change against oil and gas as well as power companies. And uh, since the constitutional actions that have been initiated uh, since uh, mid this year and perhaps even earlier. In, in Mexico, at, at the uh, beginning of next year, we will start seeing uh, the, the first final judgments with respect to those actions. 
uh, I would say January or February of, of next year. And that is when we're going to see, uh, that's how, how we see it, uh, all of those investment treaty cases uh, triggered uh, in both fronts, oil and gas as well as power. So, so that, is, that is exactly where we see things going. The, I, I go back to, the, to, the, to those treaties that I was referring to that Mexico have, has entered during the last 30 years. And uh, that was part of a very ambition, a very interesting program by the Mexican government prior to this one, which had a, a very, a very liberal, a, a, a very different uh, approach to things as opposed to the present administration led by López Obrador, we call him AMLO, that has a, a very centralized populist uh, view of things, which, which uh, are the ones that are disturbing us. People would say, well, but he's not uh, done anything about, about other industries. Uh, Rafael was referring to the auto industry, for instance. Uh, the, Mexico is uh, currently the second largest exporter of, of cars in the world, of vehicles. The country sells about $165 billion a year of cars and trucks. Uh, so people say, well, you know, uh, it's terrible that, that he's taking back the energy industry to the state. But the problem is that it, it is precisely industries like the auto industry that very much rely on reliable energy, re reliable prices, reliable uh, energy. And, uh, and many of those companies that are making cars in Mexico, like many others, are, uh, are, are, are urged to follow uh, uh, climate change rules because, because it is part of their vision. So if we transform the production or the generation of power in Mexico to uh, traditional fossil uh, sources, uh, that industry is going to have serious problems as well. So all of this has very far-reaching effects with respect to uh, not only the operators of those businesses, but also uh, the off-takers, uh, and, and certainly it has effects against EPC contractors, against banks, against everyone. So it has very far-reaching, very far-reaching effects. Interestingly, going back to Brazil, because I know that there's many listeners from Brazil in this conversation, we do not have a a, uh, a treaty, an investment treaty protection. Uh, or, or treaty, uh, or because we don't have a free trade agreement, the two countries have been sort of analyzing a, a treaty of this nature, but without taking it to the next uh, phase. So, so it is interesting to, in any event, uh, mention that most of the Brazilian investment in in uh, in our country, including one that has been affected recently, that is Braske Midesa. Uh, they made a, a, a five or six billion dollar project in, in, in here in Veracruz. Uh, all of the Brazilian investment in Mexico is, is triggered or is channeled through SPVs, which were formed in most cases in, in the Netherlands and in Austria and in other countries. So because of the lack of that protection, that, that, that has been breached to and is accounted as uh, 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 Netherlands, uh, Netherlands investments, uh, Austrian investments, and others, UK, etc. Uh, so the so this is this is how I see it. The, the preamble, the preamble of this discussion is what we're seeing right now. But unfortunately, if we follow things closely, uh, by by the beginning of next year. Uh, we will unfortunately, and that's how we foresee things, be seeing a number of these projects, and many of them are renewables, being directly affected by these series of actions, 
which will have a serious effect. And the only way to impede that to occur is to continue advising the government of Mexico that if they, they, if they wish to follow that path, that uh, Mexico will face an increasing number of arbit uh, investment treaty arbitration cases. And that is a way, uh, TBC, in which we could be saying that arbitration could have a say in this whole process. Because if it wouldn't be for the fact that Mexico has all of those investment treaties uh, you know, with all of those countries, uh, the case uh, of Mexico would certainly be more concerning as it is today. So uh, I would leave it there. Thanks again for the opportunity and best regards to all. Thank you so much, Enrique. Um, I'm sure there will be lots of questions from the audience later, but really fascinating overview in a way terrifying. Although I think uh, somehow lawyers always benefit from, from this kind of situation. So in a way, <laughs> you know, new jobs arising in Mexico for uh, uh, younger younger lawyers. Um, I will now give the floor to Philippe. Philippe, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, all. Um, we all know that climate is changing, but the regulatory and legal environment is changing much faster as a result of the climate change. And just to give you a, a few examples of what has happened recently, uh, in September of this year, the Dutch government announced that the gas field of Groningen, uh, which was uh, discovered at the end of the 50s, uh, will uh, shut down uh, definitely in 2022, and will, that is next year, and will be used only as a backup uh, for a few years. Um, this is an acceleration of the process, actually, because initially the plan to shut down that field was uh, somewhere between 2025 and 2028, according to the press. So we have here a, a government taking action right now to, to shut down uh, hydrocarbon uh, ex uh, ex exploitation uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, at the beginning of the month of November, um, many governments uh, have announced, including the US, by the way, have announced that their uh, state banks and development, development banks uh, will no longer finance hydrocarbon projects. So this will have an impact. Yesterday, uh, in the context of COP26, a number of governments, including France, my own government, uh, have announced that uh, they will ban any uh, hydrocarbon production on their territories uh, in 2035. Of course, uh, oil producing countries and gas producing countries are a bit more shy about that. Uh, and France has no oil, so it's easy for them to say that we'll discontinue. There's nothing to discontinue anyway. But nonetheless, you can see a trend here, uh, which is very quick, massive, and potentially we are looking at a mass extinction event for uh, hydrocarbon production in the coming years. Uh, this is a true revolution in history. And, and when you think about it, um, arbitration has evolved along the, let's say, variations or the, the various events affecting uh, primarily oil, but also gas. The first nationalizations uh, are, are giving rise to various decisions, which, which we all know, Amoco and the like. So uh, it's something which is very tied to arbitration. Now, um, when you see this situation uh, with potentially a massive termination of an activity that has been ongoing for uh, almost 150 years, perhaps more, um, it has consequences. Uh, and, and we can look for precedents. And in the energy sector, there are actually some precedents, very recent precedents, but they are uh, surprisingly in the renewable sector. And, and, and of course, Enrique uh, made a reference to it. It's the solar claims. Uh, your states uh, have been given incentives uh, to investor in, in the solar industry, and then they change their mind uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, which triggered a, a series of claims against Spain, Italy, uh, the Czech Republic, and possibly uh, France tomorrow, because uh, the French government enacted a decree at the end of October, essentially uh, uh, cutting the return on solar uh, contracts uh, substantially. Uh, so th that is a myriad of claims coming, uh, primarily through a BITs, uh, BIT claims, uh, as was said. But this is not an extension. This is simply changing the rules of the game. You can still, um, and it's actually encouraged in theory, uh, invest in solar energy and get your return. The governments have just changed the rules. So it's not quite 
uh, the, the right analogy. Uh, perhaps a closer analogy is what happened in some countries following Fukushima. Uh, the Germans, uh, the Swiss, the Austrians, uh, for example, among others, uh, discontinued nuclear energy. And, and what have we seen? We've seen claims, again, uh, treaty claims, but also contract claims, because of course, uh, nuclear energy uh, is a very complex aspect of energy production. Uh, there, are, there are various layers of contracts and it has had a knockoff effect uh, on various contracts. And you, very often it's so expensive that a nuclear plant is financed by various uh, stakeholders from various countries which will use the electricity uh, and you have to untangle all that. So uh, this may be a closer analogy, but of course, uh, again, it's only partial because some countries uh, have decided to increase nuclear production. Again, France, uh, that was announced by the President Macron this week. So uh, here we, we have something which has happened, but maybe not as massive and as, let's say, existential of what's happening in the oil and gas sector. And of course, you all know um, that oil and gas is based primarily on long-term contracts. Um, it, it is true for oil to some degree. It is even more true for gas. As you know, the uh, financing of the development of the, um, the Northern Sea gas fields uh, was made based on long-term contracts. It's, it is historical. Uh, the Dutch invented it. Essentially, they say it costs so much for me to develop the field that I need to have uh, uh, somebody buying my gas long term, like 30 years. Uh, and once I have that, my project is bankable and then or bankable or the state will invest. It depends. And so I will develop uh, my gas field. So uh, we have a number of long term contracts. And in oil, uh, historically, we have had concessions. And now we have production sharing agreements, uh, service agreements, which are renewed uh, regularly, depending on the lifetime of the underlying field. And, and as a result, these contracts uh, do qualify as long-term contracts. And the question is, uh, how do you treat, what is the impact of uh, this coming event of, uh, sorry, that's my light going off. I hope it will come back. Um, uh, event of, of mass extinction on those contracts. And you, you can look at primarily at three, uh, three types of remedy. Of course, you, you have termination, you have sometimes a rebalancing clause in, in the contract and sometimes, but rarely in the applicable law, uh, you have a provision enabling you to, to rebalance the contract. Of course, termination is at the end uh, and the rest is, is during the life of the contract. So, so we, we can have a look at both type of situations. Uh, and I think it's interesting because most of these contracts will have arbitration uh, provisions as well. And we do have a, a fair amount of experience uh, with this type of situation, perhaps, perhaps not of this magnitude, but certainly the, the type of situation. So first termination, generally uh, this will be, for want of a better word, termination for convenience. You have the, the, the government saying, well, I'm no longer, uh, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to stop it. Uh, I terminate. Uh, and if let's say that the government intends to respect their promises and their contract, the question will not be whether termination is valid. It can always be terminated by governments very often, uh, but uh, on how much? It's a quantum question. How will you indemnify uh, those uh, investors, companies, uh, players that have invested uh, uh, on the belief that the contract would be 30 years, but after all, it would be 15? Um, so you have a, a quantum discussion. Of course, I will not go into it because we have Susan after me uh, and uh, uh, she's far more competent than I am. Uh, but I, I would like to fly a, a few difficulties here. Uh, one, uh, how do you project uh, the oil prices because it's generally based on the projection of oil prices in the context of uh, extinction of oil production. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, interesting aspect, not necessarily legal. Um, second, uh, there is an inherent political aspect to this. So, so for governments, it will be very difficult uh, to give huge uh, amounts of money uh, for companies, even though uh, it may be contractually, um, let's say, justified. Uh, but there is a political element which will be there, uh, undoubtedly. And third, I predict a big fight on 
um, let's say, I wouldn't say decommissioning costs because of those costs are normally integrated uh, in the contract itself and already set aside, but very often uh, what I call the cost of remediation. I, I am convinced that government will invent some sort of claim to put in front of indemnification in order to match uh, the situation and say, well, by the way, uh, I terminate earlier, but we can walk away without any payment uh, being made. Uh, so this is the type of issues that I think we will um, face uh, when uh, those contracts are terminated earlier than anticipated. That's termination, broadly speaking. Now, if we move to rebalancing, uh, some of these contracts, not all of them, some of these contracts do have a clause which essentially says that if there is a change in circumstances, uh, and that includes a change in the legislation, uh, the parties will uh, either agree on modification of the contract or rebalance the contract or restore the economic equilibrium. Uh, there are various ways of expressing this idea uh, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's fairly common and, and each clause is different, uh, but these clauses do give rise to major disputes, very economical disputes, but major disputes. One example, of course, is the uh, price adjustment in long-term gas contracts, but generally speaking, we are talking about rebalancing clauses. So here, of course, the clause will not play any role when the contract is terminated. But if termination is in 2035, for example, and you know today that the contract will be terminated earlier than anticipated, uh, and you know it not only because there was a, let's say, an announcement made to this effect, but because there was a decree or law enacted uh, telling you that this is going to happen. Uh, so a clear change in legislation. The question is, does that trigger uh, your rebalancing clause in the event that there is one in your contract? The answer is probably yes. Uh, but the question is, how do you rebalance the contract then? And, and here the difficulties are even greater than assessing the amount of damages for termination. So again, it's something that I don't know whether Susan will discuss it, but it's uh, it, we have here a real difficulty because normally when you rebalance, uh, you try to restore the equilibrium and you try to look at the expectations of the parties either at the beginning of the contract or last time you changed, the, the you restored the, the equilibrium. So, uh, but here there is something which is far more fundamental, which is happening, is that the contract will no longer exist. So it's not a question of rebalancing the contract for the future. It's taking into account the fact that it will come to an end much earlier than anticipated. And I have to say, I have no answer to how you operate or how does the clause operate in those circumstances. And the third aspect, perhaps, uh, is in some laws, like uh, the law of Algeria or other countries, you have a provision uh, essentially uh, enabling you either to rebalance or to terminate. And that, that could be the case in Italian law uh, uh, under certain circumstances uh, if uh, performance of the contract become too onerous or if there is a change in circumstances. My experience of those, um, let's say, statute-based uh, provisions is that it is very rare for them to, to be able to operate and to have a practical effect because the conditions are very strict. Uh, but we can expect uh, investors to look into those provisions uh, in the event that there is a change in circumstances and there is no rebalancing clause in the contract. So here I'm just flagging this as a potential, uh, uh, let's say, field for dispute in the future, uh, but not, of course, uh, giving any answer. So th this is where we are. And here it's simply speaking about the main contracts. But there is, of course, as I said, a knockoff effect. Uh, these contracts are often at the top of a chain of contracts, uh, which will then themselves be affected by this situation. So the, the whole discussion that we've just had will flow down the chain of contracts, if I can say so, uh, with one, of course, difference is that the change in legislation may not come from the law governing the contract. Maybe you have, for example, uh, you invested in the Netherlands by, uh, in the Groningen field, but there is a service contract underneath which is governed by, I don't know, Turkish law. So the question is, what? how do you treat a change in the upper layer of the chain of contract and what is the impact on the layers underneath? And here, of course, I have no answer whatsoever, but I can also predict that, that we will face a number of difficulties there. So. Uh, this is what I wanted to, to cover at this point in the interest of time. Perhaps I will give the floor to the next speaker so that we have time to, to discuss and to have questions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Philippe, uh, for this comprehensive overview of how climate change can have an impact on long-term contracts. And I think your presentation triggers a fundamental question, which is who takes the hit in this situation and links us very well to the next and final presentation uh, on damages. So without further ado, uh, Susan, you have the floor. Great, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so, so Philippe, I, I won't pretend to have uh, answers to all of the questions that you asked, but I actually will, uh, as I as I said in the preparation panel, but I actually will attempt to answer one small corner uh, of all the questions raised. Um, might as well give it a go, right? So, so um, over, I'm working on this case right now, and it's an oil and gas case. The contract was signed. It's an uh, upstream exploration and production contract. It was signed in the late 90s. And I'm looking through the files a couple of weeks ago. And I come across this document that was drafted in the mid 1990s. And it's the oil and gas plan for, for this country. And, and I read the opening sentence of the document and it, it struck me, uh, particularly in light of this panel. So I wrote it down. And, and here's what it says. It says, Analysis of the trends in the development of the world economy shows that oil and gas will be the main principal source of consumed energy, not only in the second half of this century, but into the 21st century and the foreseeable future. Now, here we are today on November 12th, 2021, right after COP26, and I can see you know, my fellow panelists smiling, and, and that sentence makes a bit less sense uh, today. You know, It's harder to imagine someone writing that sentence uh, and legitimately thinking that oil and gas will, will be our primary energy source well into the 22nd century. Uh, and, and that's because you know, the United Nations says pretty clearly, and, and I quote, you know, to preserve a livable climate, greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced to net zero by 2050, unquote. And, and we know many countries are signing up and saying, yes, this is what we want to do. Public and private organizations are doing this. We're seeing it at all municipal, at various uh, levels of government, municipal, states, uh, nation states. And, uh, you know, I think at this point, it's pretty safe to say that most of the world has heard of climate change. We, we know it's happening and we need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels in order to do something about it. You know, I, I like to think that at this point, um, any position that's different than that is, is truly a fringe position. And, and so while the, the consensus is that we are certainly going too slowly in our reliance on fossil fuels, we are actually seeing reductions in important places. So the U.S. Energy Information Administration uh, forecasts that the United States will have actually hit its peak oil consumption in 2019. And the current estimates for 2021 shows that we will not exceed that uh, peak use. Uh, and their forecast for the future is that we will continue not to exceed the 2020, uh, the 2019 consumption levels. Um, and you know, you might be thinking, well, what does all this have to do with arbitration? But I, I, I promise I'm getting there. But I wanted to read one more sentence from this document um, that was uh, also struck me. Again, very first paragraph of the document, and uh, this country has offshore oil. So this, this paragraph went on to say, and I quote, however, for all the outward prosperity, there are a number of complex problems that are having an adverse impact on the rate of development of explored fields and the rate of attainment of a higher production level for crude hydrocarbons. Above all, one should note the continuing rise of the offshore sea level and consequently the very real threat of flooding of some of the main oil producing areas. So I read this and went, well, well okay, maybe these authors do know about climate change and they were really ahead of the game. Um, but actually in that 60 page document, it never once again, it, it doesn't mention climate change anywhere. Not global warming, nothing. Uh, there's just this strange, bizarre rising sea level thing happening and we have to plan for it. Uh, but this this policy paper for this country says nothing about climate change. I, I can assure you that also is very different from helping countries draft their plans for their oil and gas sector. For for my 15 year career so far, that would be you just don't see that anymore. You you always say something about your your country plan for your oil and gas sector. 
So what does all this have to do with arbitration? I, mean, I think uh, Philippe made a very good presentation that, that oil and gas has obviously been critical to arbitration as long as arbitration has, has existed. Um, according to ICSID's 1966 to 2021 caseload statistics, 25% of cases are oil, gas, and mining cases. Uh, I don't think that surprises anyone. Um, so you know, one in four cases are oil, gas, and mining cases, and I'd be willing to say that the majority of those are probably oil and gas cases. And moreover, we you know we know that three quarters of global energy demand continues to be met by fossil fuels. But I think the question is, uh, and and all of our panelists have already begun to hit on this, is how long will that last? So in the very near term, I think that you know in the in the next ten to twenty years we will see. Uh, fossil fuel consumption continue to rise, um, but probably not by much. And forecasts continue to change about exactly when we'll hit peak oil consumption. But um, that number has been 2050 uh, for quite some time now for most forecasters, although it, it changes a bit here and there. Um, I, you know, I don't think anyone knows exactly when we can say when the carbon transition will happen, but I think we can all agree that it should it should happen. It needs to happen. And so uh, this produces uh, a number of consequences that you know, there will very likely be an oversupply of, of oil assets. I mean, Philippe gave us a good example of Groningen. I'll probably say it incorrectly, you can correct me, but um, the Groningen field in the Netherlands, uh, you know, that is an asset that will apparently not be used anymore. You know, we, we've got too much oil at this, at this point, too much oil, gas, and coal. Um, we will see a volatility of prices increase uh, as as we go through the carbon transition, as the market tries to understand exactly which projects will stay and go, uh, that will that will result in even more volatility in the sector. But uh, with reduced demand and oversupply, it's hard to conclude anything other than that in the long term, the price of oil, gas and mining uh, commodities will go down. That that's the most reasonable conclusion you can say. Now the details, you know, are are not easy. If I could forecast these commodities, I'd be in an entirely different business. Uh, but that's the general that's the general trend. So so if you're an arbitrator in one of these in a, in one of these cases, let's take an investment treaty case where sovereign nation terminates contract uh, for the exploration and production of oil and gas. And you decide that there is there's jurisdiction and there's liability, and now you've come to the question of damages. Uh, you know, we, we know the basic fundamentals of damages. Uh, they the investor should be in the position that it would have been had the act creating liability not occurred, and damages should not be speculative. So you know, in our hypothetical case of this oil and gas contract that's been terminated you'll probably have a claim for lost profits, these you know, future profits that are no longer going to accrue to you because the contract has been terminated. Uh, and, and the standard there is that these lost profits must have been sufficiently, they must be sufficiently certain to have occurred. Uh, and it's very likely that in this case, um, that calculation of what those lost profits would have been would, have, would be done using a, a discounted cash flow analysis. And uh, again, you know, it, as Philippe very well covered, these are very long-term contracts. Uh, I fully agree that you rarely find an oil, gas, or mining project of any kind, upstream, midstream, refining, or otherwise, that is less than a 25-year contract due to the upfront high capital cost and the need to recoup that investment. So you're looking at um, a potential future that's easily 20 or 30 years, potentially more. Because uh, I agree, you often do see the contracts in this sector that will say, uh, particularly in mining, less so in oil and gas, that if there are still reserves there, there is a right to extend the contract until those reserves are exhausted. So if I'm an arbitrator looking at this investment treaty case and I am trying to decide, uh, if I'm, I'm looking at the world, I have to take into account these, these factual trends that are occurring. Um, and, and against this backdrop, backdrop, I actually come to the conclusion that it, it is far less likely that an oil and gas project or a coal mining project will be profitable for decades to come. Uh, and that it is more likely that oil, gas, and coal mining projects 
will not meet the sufficient certainty test for lost profit damages. Um, now, of course, this is a very highly fact-specific inquiry. You know, we can imagine a range of different scenarios where we've got maybe five years left on a contract for oil and gas production. Will that, pro will that project continue and, and operate profitably? Most likely, yes. So would it make sense to award damages in such a case? Would it meet a sufficient certainty test? You know, probably, you know, creating a hypothetical. But, but let's take the, the kind of opposite scenario where we've got a, an oil and gas uh, contract that was maybe signed, you know, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. And exploring has taken quite a long time. Often the exploration and appraisal phase can take decades in and of itself for these contracts. And, um, you know, maybe we're at the stage where we found oil and gas. We're still appraising it, but we haven't put in the intense capital expenditure to develop that asset. I mean, before before climate change, it was not an inexorable truth that that oil and gas projects would move forward. Uh, there were many scenarios in which, you know, the cost of the project was just simply not economic for reasons completely unrelated to climate change. But in light of climate change, it, it really seems even more illogical to say that a fossil fuel project that has not yet started operations should be assumed to go ahead and that it would generate lost profits for decades to come. Uh, now, you know, we, we said, OK, well, um, does it matter when that contract was signed? Uh, I would say from a damages perspective, probably not. That the sufficient certainty standard, that test, is sufficiently capable of accommodating the way the world has changed as a factual matter uh, we don't need uh, to, to necessarily, that, that probably doesn't change the analysis, uh, though we're all still figuring this out. So I'd be interested to hear what other, other views are on that. Um, that's probably not true for a liability question. But I think from a damages perspective, when the contract was signed is less important than what the stage, the operational stage of the project. Uh, I think that's probably the critical aspect that we're going to be looking at in terms of a, a damages analysis in an investment treaty arbitration case. Um, so, you know, it, it's, you could say, I guess you could say, well, maybe should we just discount, use a higher discount rate and a low price assumption? And maybe that will, that will accommodate our need to award damages. You, my instinct is that you, that's basically saying the same thing is that it's just not sufficiently at some point if you've discounted a, a project so much aren't you essentially saying in a world that's really more art than science that this project is too speculative it's too risky and we can't know with sufficient certainty that it would continue operating at a profit um so so i think that's i i think in some we can we can say Perhaps one small thing with some amount of certainty, which is um, we should expect fewer uh, lost profits, damages claims in the oil, gas, and mining sector uh, for, for projects that, that continue on for decades into the future. Um, now, I have avoided entirely the question of exactly what pricing should be used for, for, for contracts. Um, for for any such case where we do say yes, um, it is sufficiently certain that this would would keep on going, um, and I have definitely entirely avoided um, the economic equilibrium analysis. But either way, I do think the the fact that the long term trend of fewer projects moving forward um, that is going to happen as a matter of of fact, and we're already seeing that. I mean, the 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 oil and gas sector is is littered with bid rounds around the globe that have not gone very well for the countries. I mean, there, there's just noticeable, uh, le noticeably less interest in uh, exploration oil contracts, at least in, in the recent past. One might say that the, the high oil prices today, we might see that change, but my, my best guess is that's not the case, um, that we're, we're the days of the billion dollar signature bonus to acquire oil, gas, and mining assets is, is probably over and we're looking at a different, a different world at this point. Um, so I'll actually, I'll stop there. Uh, and, but I would like to thank uh, the, the conference sponsors, Oxford Arbitration, uh, you know, the Oxford Arbitration Day and the organizers there, 
and the fellow panelists and, and um, my colleagues, Andrew Larkin and Jean Lambert, who we, we had lots of, they, they provided a lot of good feedback to me about the ideas uh, that we're talking about today. And I'd definitely like to give them, give them thanks for, for their help in thinking through these complex matters. Thank you so much, Susan. I think you, you've touched a very sensitive nerve in this discussion, and I'm glad we're finishing with these. And um, I would like to open the floor for questions, if uh, there are any um, from the audience. Um, I believe if there are any, I will see them in the chat. Uh, but perhaps while we wait for a question uh, from the audience, and I, uh, I will kindly ask um, the organizers to let me know if there are any questions which I'm not seeing in the chat. Um, something that, that came to mind when all of you were speaking, and uh, if any of you want to comment on, on this point, which I would like to make is, um, I wonder to what extent we could say that international oil companies that were signing these kind of contracts in the 90s, especially, where we, one could claim the states had a vague understanding of um, climate change and what caused climate change. In fact, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change dates back to 1994. Uh, in fact, 1992, and then entered into force in 1994. So at that time, states were already aware that we already had had the first IPCC report. So to some extent, knowledge was there. But I wonder whether we could even say that there is an asymmetry in the level of information that international oil companies had in the 90s and states had, and to, to some extent, well, whether we could say that international oil companies who knew, because there are claims that they knew they were doing already studies knowing that greenhouse gases emissions were one of the major sources of global warming and, and, and in turn of climate change, were not disclosing that information which they were gathering themselves. They were entering into these contracts knowing that you know, these investments could be risky and the circumstances could have changed. They did not disclose that kind of information. And, and when it comes to then, you know, claiming damages, well, they say there, there has been a change in circumstances which you did not foresee. And here we are. I think you need to pay up. And also, I think the, the question of who uh, should pay up. Is it this, especially, in, you know, when you're, we're dealing with an investment claim, why would the taxpayer have to, you know, chip in when it comes to perhaps also, you know, an administration overseeing, you know, issues of this kind? So I'm happy to um, open the floor on this point or on any other point that the speakers might have. But, but I think um, it's an interesting question. Uh, and... And I'll, I'll, I will be very happy to hear your views on these. Uh, Timish, I'm happy to start. I was there in the 90s, uh, even though I, I, I do not plan to, 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 to speak on behalf of the players of the industry. Uh, but, the, but I think there is a, a missing element in your question is that the decision to switch from hydrocarbon to renewable is a political decision. It's not an economic decision. The cost is astronomical. Uh, but it's a political decision. And in Europe, for example, there is a, strate a strategic element to it, uh, which is uh, energy independency, uh, which, which is, uh, um, let's say, not absent uh, from, from that decision. So the, the, the question that um, companies faced was, was not so much the issue of climate change and the impact and, uh, and the scientific knowledge. We, we are still in the infancy of this, unfortunately. We, we see things happening, but we... Um, uh, we, are, we are still finding out uh, how we can, how best we can uh, uh, avoid that. And of course, measures are taken, but it's a, it's the beginning. But the, the question was, at which point uh, uh, governments will make that decision? Uh, and it, it's very difficult to decide. As you say, one, one administration may have a view, the next administration may have another view. Um, so uh, 
I, I think the question is slightly more complicated than, than the, the scientific aspect. There is also a political element to it, and there is also how the people in each country would react to that and uh, how much they can pay, uh, because it's a rich country problem uh, to switch from you know, to clean energy. To, to, to be honest, m many countries uh, have much pressing problems, which is uh, people starving. So, so you, you see, that's the, that's the, that's the difficulty. And, and I profess no answer and no view, frankly. But it, it's just that it is very complicated because there is a political element to it, in my view. Yeah, I, I agree uh, with Lee. And I think that the, it's hard to say that whether they had disclosed those companies, if they knew or if they had any reasonable level of certainty if that would have made any difference in the, the government's decision because in the end the governments were offering the opportunity for those companies to invest right uh we can of course uh speculate of uh, how those opportunities were generated but that's beside the point uh the fact is well let's get the case of brazil the, the government will invite companies to bid either local or international companies and those companies would accept the invitation and would bid right uh, and I doubt that for, for, for several countries, that was a strategic decision, as Philippe, uh, as, as Philippe pointed out, that uh, for, for quite some time, the strategic interest in uh, self-sufficiency trumped uh, the interest in, pro in protecting the environment. That's, that's the, the hard truth. It's, it, it's, it, we know for a fact now that it was a wrong decision. But if we go back in time and we we remove what we know and see the decision making process at that point which is a hard process which is a hard exercise right uh the, i think the hard question is would that have made a difference even if the companies say look we have a vague idea that this could this may have an effect we don't know exactly what it is we don't know exactly you know how to establish causation we still don't know how to establish causation right uh 30 years later so I don't think that uh, I think that it's it's a difficult question. I think that of course it's it, it's 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 almost a philosophical and moral uh, question. Uh, you know, it's a very very tricky very tricky uh, scenario in which we are dealing with. And you know, there's often there are terrible outcomes, even if the intentions are good, when we investigate this kind of uh, this kind of thing. That, that just occurred to me that that uh, 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 Philippe said that governments change their minds and uh, we're seeing it in Mexico it is it is terribly evident uh, when this administration is over we will hopefully think like we were thinking four years ago uh, but you are seeing this government, jeopardizing renewables and investing four billion dollars in a new refinery so uh and and the other my other thought was that when when uh, both my colleagues uh, uh philippe and rafael are referring to the world and uh the world's decisions we have to take it with a grain of salt because it's not the whole world uh, when you see countries uh, sadly, again, the case of today's Mexico, going exactly against all of these efforts. Exactly, it's 180 degrees against this trend. Uh, and we, have to, we need to think that we are not the only ones. Without going any further, other Latin American countries are taking that path. And I hope this is not the case, but in Brazil, you might be seeing a different government making decisions that are completely different as well because we don't know it is it is I mean, like extrapolating the case of of glasgow and the things that were decided and that we would think that the rest of the world will follow not we don't even know if china will will follow that lead it's it's i think that uh, a bit too early to know if this is really going to happen if by 250 we're going to have that transformation uh, because it's a very a very crazy world and uh, and uh, government governments and political decisions 
follow that crazy line of, of thinking. So, I don't know. I think that we are very much, very much speculating what's going to be the case. Uh, we hope for the best, but I'm not sure that we can assume that it's going in that, that are necessarily going in that direction, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I, I can jump in a little bit, and, and I, maybe a different way to put what you were saying, Tibisai, is, is you know, who bears the risk of climate change regulatory measures and investment arbitration? I, mean, I take it that's that's kind of another way to think about the problem. Um, and, and and I guess let's let's say specifically investment treaty arbitration is what we what what you maybe had in mind. Um, you know, not the not the subcontracts that Philippe was talking about, although. As he said, they would obviously they, they there are many scenarios in which they would be affected. And you know, when you answer that question, you do who, what party should bear the risk in any any situation? You ask, well, who has the knowledge and the control over that issue? And that party is the party that should bear that risk. Now, I don't know how far that takes you in in this scenario because I, I do think we would all agree that oil and gas companies had more knowledge about climate change than most countries did. At an earlier time period, um, we have very little evidence to to think otherwise. Um, but then the question of control is a, is more challenging. I, you know, I think it, it's it's tempting to say, well, it's certainly the governments that have all the control. But as everyone said, it's much more complicated than that. Governments are responding to political pressure; uh, they don't exist in an, in a vacuum. Um, and so, so that's the harder part. Uh, I don't have a I don't have an answer to your question. Um, what I will say is I don't think it matters. I, I'll maintain my position that I don't think it matters from a damages perspective, actually. I, I continue. I would continue to say that that is a fact-based inquiry that has to take in the consideration of the trends of the eco economic sector that, that this investment has occurred. Uh, and, and, and that is completely neutral to... Um, uh, you know, what the liability side and, and the knowledge and control issue that you are raising. Um, so I'll, I'll stick to my damages corner because it's actually easier than the liability corner, I think. Yeah, and if I can make a comment, I don't know who bears the risk, but I know who's going to pay for it in that sense. <laughs> and speaking for myself, I'm happy to pay for it, but we have to be very, very candid about that. <laughs> no, I think, and that's a very good point um, that, that, you know, if I, you, you could imagine a very creative lawyer somewhere saying, well, let's sue the entire uh, developed world that has benefited massively from fossil fuels. Uh, you know, there's no question that my life and e entire existence has benefited from the, the production of fossil fuels, the, uh, the car I drive, the computer I'm on right now, uh, all of it. So, the, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll see some very clever litigation um, uh, th th there's maybe something very creative out there. I, I I do think it would be wrong for us to leave the panel before saying that um, the, one of the critical problems is, and it's it was alluded to, but uh, for all the countries that have no power energy whatsoever and that have oil, gas, and mining resources and want their chance to use them, it's a very depressing place to be, to be told, you know, actually that's a terrible idea and it's not your turn. Uh, and, and that's a big problem. It's a political problem. I don't think international arbitration has much to to say or do about that, quite frankly. Though, you know, to any creative student on this uh, listening in, um, maybe I'm wrong, but but that's my instinct: is that that arbitration doesn't have much to say or a solution necessarily for that. But um, you know, I'm I'm open to to contrary positions on that. There is definitely an ethical question there, and I think that's where we're pointing to. Um, I think, Rafael, you wanted to add something. There is also a question from the audience, which I'm going to read in a second, but before I give the floor to Rafael. I, I was just going to, to add that there's there's all, uh, to, to Susan's uh, prior point, which is, you know, there, there's all kinds of situations. Uh, you have, for instance, the situation of the pre-salt uh, reserves in Brazil, which you know, Brazil started discussing how to divide the royalties, and it spent so much time doing that that when it, we finally decided how to do it, the, it was economically unfeasible because the oil prices dropped so much and it was so expensive to extract the, this oil, and we actually didn't actually need it. It wasn't, you know, and 
and, and you have other specific circumstances. Brazil is now investing on uh, thermal power plants, but just not because we want to. We, we want it. It's just because we have hydro and solar and and uh, and wind that that accounts for more than eighty percent of the of the the energy matrix, but they are not reliable. So you need backup. You need backup. Right. And and the fact that and, and the fact that we are already with more than 80 percent of our uh, matrix with energy, uh, renewable energy makes it that every, any breach uh, to any other uh, any worsening of scenarios of other activities since like the deforestation makes it so that Brazil has its emissions worse than in prior years. Right. And if you if you use that information politically, which, you know, it's uh, Every, everything that the press and all politicals do in Brazil, I'm not defending the government or attacking the government. I'm just saying it happens for both sides. You know, the government is doing a poor job in protecting the rainforest, but it's not as bad as they as they as they say. You know, it's politically motivated. Both sides are politically mo motivated, and so we need to uh, to take it with a grain of salt and to see specifically the situation of each country, as Susan put it. It's it's hard to say, to get a, a a developing country to say now you have something that it's it, you know had some value will help you uh, make the lives of poor people that people are starving better but you know, you cannot use it well just because I'm using just because because I'm doing it a hundred years after you did it right and I think this is this create the more the biggest uh, the biggest tensions uh, in COP twenty six. As it did in COP twenty five and in, in every COP, uh, you know. Definitely. Um, there are two questions from the audience. Um, the first, which I will read now, uh, stabilization clauses often include exceptions on compensation freezing relating to changes of law relating to improvement of international environmental standards. Could measures taken in application of climate change treaties possibly fit? in as exceptions to stabilization clauses. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to take this question. I will read the second too, so I give you some time to think who wants to take the first question. Um, this I think is addressed to Susan actually, the second question. I wonder if the panelists, have, oh actually no, she's thanking Susan for saying, I wonder if the panelists have thoughts on how events like COP26 will start playing a role in legitimate expectations of investors. You can start from either question. Um, yeah, I, I would say that from, from, from the second one, I think that's the precise uh, issue that we were discussing, whether or not um, th there was a legitimate expectation to trust or distrust whatever the government is saying. Right, as 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 you know, as the concession, uh, as the as the power who grants the concession, um, maybe, uh, and that would vary in industry and in time specifically. Because nowadays, of course, it's it's hard to, to to make a claim that you you would ignore the possibility of climate change events um, having an impact in your in your investment. But in the early nineties. Oh well, there is, uh, there is, there was the 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 Rio ninety two um, uh, document that that would make reference to that. Yes, but no one knew exactly how that would if, uh, how that would play a role in each industry and each specific contract. I would say that uh, for sure, as as science progresses and as countries recognize through uh, binding either binding or non binding documents. That this is a reality, and uh, and that this is a changing landscape, then uh, it's harder to to ignore, uh, and it's harder to make a claim of legitimate expectation that nothing will change. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree, uh, and just on the stabilization clause question, which is a very very good question, um, uh, rebalancing clauses are complicated, but stabilization clauses are even more complicated and they are very specific so i i, I hesitate to formulate a, a general answer my answer would be uh, have a very uh, careful look at the clause and the way it's drafted 
to see whether it can fit into the the exception. But if you do not, uh, I, I predict that there will be a debate as to whether stabilization clause should uh, apply altogether to climate change uh, regulatory changes because it's, it would be legitimate. The same debate we had with tax, but apply to climate change. Uh, for me, uh, it's a question of whether you want to respect the rule of law. If you if you promise a clause, it, it has to apply. Then it you may moderate the way it applies. You may moderate compensation, there, but but not not the principle because you are defending a clause. I think that that would be dangerous to the rule of law. So, but that that's just my my my, my view, of course. And I, I guess I would just add to that that um, not only would you need to look at the clause in question, you would need to look at the the action taken by the government in question, uh, and and it, what exactly is the impact on that particular investor um, you know would a would would completely terminating the contract be an acceptable um, you know would that fall into an exception a carve out in a stabilization clause that said well yes improving improving laws of a country for and, and I have drafted and negotiated these clauses um, and so if it says something to the extent of uh, no change in law uh, or that shall um, you know, be affect this contract unless it falls within the categories of social, environmental, improved standards in the country. Um, okay, so that that does tell you something. That's Philippe's point. Well, we need to read the clause pretty carefully. Um, but then, what is the actual measure that we're talking about? If it's completely terminating that contract, that's one thing. Um, if it is cleaner standards for oil and gas companies, maybe you can no longer flare your gas, that's another thing. So it, it's not just the clause itself, it's what's the action that's being taken. Um, in it, that, that's the other side of the equation that you would have to look at. Enrique, were you taking the floor or? No. no. Okay, because no. you unmuted your mic. Um, I'm I think it's 5.30 and I'm aware that um, there is a final panel, an interview with Lucy just coming after us. So perhaps we want to give the audience an opportunity to take a break. It has been really, really interesting, this conversation today. I really learned a lot from all the speakers and I really enjoyed this discussion in the Q&A. Um, I would like once again to thank um, the organizers for putting together this fantastic panel. And I would like to warmly thank my panelists who have impressively respected the 15 minutes uh, time frame. I, I have to say this is unprecedented. So I really have to thank them because they made my job much, much easier. Um, thank you, the audience, for listening. And uh, um, we very much look forward to the interview coming just after this. But um, thanks again, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.